right. Hello, hello, and how is everybody? I do hope you're doing well. Um, it's a Friday afternoon, and so therefore, it's time for the tiara. <laughs> we are still in lockdown in this part of New Zealand. We are in the Auckland region, and so therefore, um, one of the ways of just lightening it a little is is going with formal Friday instead of um, casual Friday, which is what you do when you go into offices and things like that. Sometimes they want to lighten things up a bit. Well, we're lightening it up a bit when we're at home by going a little bit more formal. So I have something to drink. No, that's not bubbly. It is bubbles, but it's not bubbly. That's a New Zealand soft drink called L&P. L&P, um, short for lemon and pyro, which is... Uh, Pyro is a place and it's also the name of um, the nickname for the mineral water that's from there and that's where this, this particular drink came from. We've had students live with us who weren't so sure of it when they first had it. Um, it's just a lemony, sweet, fizzy drink. Um, but before they went home they made sure they had plenty of it so they could remember it and I think some of them even tried to take some home back to Europe. Not sure. Anyway, so I'm Jeff. I read old-fashioned children's stories and I blether on a little bit at the beginning and end and also in chapter breaks. Um, you're welcome to chat in the um, stream chat if you want to, just type away there. Uh, but I won't actually be commenting on anything that's said in the chat until a chapter break. So just because, you know, keep the flow of the story up. I will interrupt myself to explain things if I think that's appropriate. Um, I'm very familiar with the fact that I understand a lot of old-fashioned things that are in a lot of the stories that I read, because that's the sort of stories I read. Uh, most people these days don't. I grew up reading these stories. Uh, my parents read the same stories, and my grandparents also read some of these same stories. So I have a long history of um, different sorts of books to what most people read these days. And so I'm aware that, that some of the things they talk about aren't what most people are familiar with. And I will explain those if I think it's appropriate. Occasionally an author will catch me out and actually explain something um, rather than just assuming that everybody who's reading their book will actually understand already. But that doesn't matter. So current, we have finished a number of books. The most recent one was Heidi. And we are now reading um, a new book. Not new book, but new for us. And it is called Just William by a lady called Richmond Crompton. And she was a school teacher, but I don't think she ever married or had children. And yet her understanding of the personality of this young William seems to be extra, extraordinary, extra good, accurate to the sort of ways that little boys think little boys um, he's about 11 but it's written in an era which um, people tended to be a little bit more innocent in their mindset because that's the way the world was at the time so before we get seriously started I have a couple of things to go over do you have something to drink especially water to keep yourself hydrated and something to snack on I have some popcorn here for myself, um, just to keep you going, and somewhere comfortable to sit while you listen. Um, these are casual stories, casual readings. These are not like an audio book. You will get lots of interruptions when I'm reading for you, and I will muff things up. I will say words wrong. I will um, get lost in the middle of a line, because I have ADHD, and that happens sometimes, believe it or not. Uh, but that doesn't matter. These are more like... Uh, bedtime stories than um, audio books so there it's a lot more fun that way it's not quite so sterile and boring anyway let's carry on we shall read the next section just William by Richmond Crompton and we are reading chapter 5 the show let's go the outlaws sat around the old barn plunged in deep thought Henry, the oldest member, aged twelve and a quarter, had said in a moment of inspiration, let's think of something else to do, something quite fresh from what we've done before. And the outlaws were thinking. They had engaged in mortal combat with one another, 
They had cooked strange ingredients over a smoking and reluctant flame with a fine disregard of culinary conventions. They had tracked each other over the countryside with gait and complexions intended to represent those of the Aborigines of South America. In other words, plain pretend. They had even turned their attention to kidnapping without any striking success, and these occupations had palled un- just going to adjust my camera again. I've got it too much the wrong way. It's a little better. Anyway, carrying on. Sorry, itchy eye. Um, and these occupations had palled. It, in all its activities, the Society of Outlaws, comprising four members, aimed at a simple, unostentatious mode of procedure. In their shrinking from the glare of publicity, they showed an example of unaffected modesty that many other public societies might profitably emulate. The parents of the members were unaware of the very existence of the society. The ill-timed and tactless interference of parents had nipped in the bud many a cherished plan, and by bitter experience the outlaws had learned that secrecy was their only protection. Owing to the rules and restrictions of an unsympathetic world that orders school hours from nine till four, their meetings were confined to half holidays and occasionally Sunday afternoons. Uh, The book is set in England. A half holiday is a half day off school. Um, A lot more commonly done over there than it was ever done in New Zealand. Um... I'm just trying to think of where, why that would be. Probably because in New Zealand, unless you were in a city, the children had quite a way to travel to school. It wasn't just around the corner, and so therefore you couldn't go to school in the morning and just walk home at lunchtime and stay home. Um, whereas a lot of the English schools, um, especially in this sort of an era, that was every, every village had its school, basically, um, and all the children who lived nearby would go home at lunchtime We've had that already with William, and then they would come back again after lunch. And on a half holiday, you would actually go to school in the morning and then have the afternoon off. Fine, lovely, but not something that's in our experience here in New Zealand. I'll carry on. William, the ever ingenious, made the first suggestion. Let's shoot things with bows and arrows, same as real outlaws used to, he said. What things? And... What bows and arrows, said Henry and Ginger simultaneously. Oh, anything, birds and cats and hens and things, and buy arrows. And buy bows and arrows. You can buy them in the shops. We can make them, said Douglas hopefully. Not like you can get them in shops. They'd shoot crooked or something. If we made them, they've got to be just so to shoot straight. I saw some in Brooke's window too, just right, just same as real outlaws had don't know where he gets these ideas from probably possibly from the movies how much said the outlaws breathlessly five shillings targets for learning on before we begin shooting real things and all five shillings breathed douglas he might as well have said five pounds we've not got five shillings henry's not having any money since he broke their drawing room window and ginger only has threepence a week and has to give collection and we've not paid for the guinea pig yet the one that got into Ginger's sister's hat, and she was so mad at, and, oh, never mind all that, said William scornfully. We'll just get five shillings. How? Well, uncertainly, grown-ups can always get money when they want it. How? Again. William disliked being tied down to details. Oh, bazaars and things, he said impatiently. Bazaars? exploded Henry. Who'd come to a bazaar if we had one? Who would? Just tell me that, if you're so clever. Who'd come to it? It's like a, um, a village fair day. Um, uh, with sales of things, mainly. Just tell me that. Um, no, no, hang on a minute. Who'd come to it? Besides, you've got to sell things at a bazaar, haven't you? What did we sell? We've got nothing to sell, have we? What's the good of having a bazaar with nothing to sell and no one to buy it? Just tell me that. (laughs) Henry always enjoyed scoring off William. Well, shows and things, said William desperately. There was a moment's silence, then Ginger repeated thoughtfully. Shows. 
and Douglas, whose eldest brother was home from college for his vacation, murmured self-consciously, By Jove! <laughs> I'm guessing his brother is off at um, college and comes back with a few different phrases and behaviours to what he used to when he was um, at home all the time. We could do a show, said Ginger, get animals and things and charge money for looking at them. Oh dear, who's having flashbacks to when we were reading the, the would-be goods and they put on a show with the, the farm animals. Mm, do you remember what happened there? I wonder what's going to happen in this one. We'll find out. Who'd pay it, said, the hen, uh, said Henry the data. Anyone would. You'd pay to see animals, wouldn't you? Real animals. People do at the zoo, don't they? Well, we'll get some animals. That's easy enough, isn't it? A neighbouring church clock struck four and the meeting was adjourned. Well, we'll have to we'll well we'll have a show and get money and buy bows and arrows and shoot things, summed up William, and we'll arrange the show next week. William returned home slowly and thoughtfully. He sat on his bed, his hands in his pockets, his brow drawn into a frown, his thoughts wandering in a dreamland of wonderful shows and rare exotic beasts. Suddenly from the next room came a thin sound that gathered volume till it seemed to fill the house like the roaring of a lion, then died gradually away and was followed by silence. But only for a second it began again a small whisper that grew louder and louder, became a raucous bellow, then faded slowly away to rise again after a moment's silence. In the next room, William's, aunt, M William's mother's Aunt Emily was taking her afternoon nap. Aunt Emily had come down a month ago for a week's visit and had not yet referred to the date of her departure. William's father was growing rapidly, was growing anxious. She was a stout, healthy lady who spent all her time recovering from a slight illness she had had two years ago. Her life held two occupations and only two. These were eating, these were eating and sleeping. For William, she possessed a subtle but irresist irresistible fascination. Her stature, her appetite, her gloom, added to the fact that she utterly ignored him, attracted him strongly. The tea bell rang and the sound of the snoring ceased abruptly. This entertainment over, William descended to the dining room where his father was addressing his mother with some heat. Is she going to stay here forever or only for a few years? I'd like to know because... Perceiving William, he stopped abruptly and William's mother murmured, It's so nice to have her, dear. <laughs> then Aunt Emily entered. Have you slept well, Aunt? Slept, repeated Aunt Emily majestically. I hardly expect to sleep in my state of health. A little rest is all I can expect. Sorry, you're no better, said William's father sardonically. Better, she repeated again indignantly. It will be a long time before I'm better. She lowered her large, healthy frame into a chair, carefully selected a substantial piece of bread and butter and attacked it with vigour. I'm going to... I'm going to the post after tea, said William's mother. Would you care to come with me? Aunt Emily took a large helping of jam. You hardly expect me to go out in the evening in my state of health, surely. It's years since I went out after tea, and I was at the post office this morning. There were a lot of people there, but they served me first. I suppose they saw I looked ill. William's father choked suddenly and apologised, but not humbly. Though I must say, went on Aunt Emily, this place does suit me. I think after a few months here, I should be a little stronger. Pass the jam, William. <laughs> oh dear. The glance that William's father fixed upon her would have made a stronger woman quail. But Aunt Emily was scraping out the last remnants of jam and did not notice. I'm a bit overtired today, I think she went on. I am so apt to forget how weak I am and then I overdo it. I'm ready for the cake, William. I just sat out in the sun yesterday afternoon and sat a bit too long and overtired myself. I ought to write letters after tea, but I don't think I have the strength. 
Another piece of cake, William. I'll go upstairs to rest instead. I think. I hope you'll keep the house quiet. It's so rarely that I can get a bit of sleep. William's father left the room abruptly. William sat on and watched. With fascinated eyes, the cake disappear and finally followed the large, portly figure upstairs and sat down in his room to plan the show. And incidentally, listen with a certain thrilled awe for the sounds from next door. The place and time of the show presented no little difficulty. To hold it in the barn would give away to the world the cherished secret of their meeting place. It was William who suggested his bedroom. To be entered not by way of the front door and staircase, but by the less public way of the garden wall and scullery roof. I'm sorry, I'm just checking to see if it's raining. No, I don't think it is. It must be just the sound of the wind over the roof. Um, I've got the skylights open behind me and I don't want the rain coming in. Ah, uh, Ever an optimist, he affirmed that no one would see or hear. The choice of a time was limited to Wednesday afternoon, Saturday afternoon and Sunday. Sunday, was at what, Sunday at first was ruled out as impossible, but there were difficulties about Wednesday afternoon and Saturday afternoon. On Wednesday afternoon, Ginger and Douglas were unwilling and ungrateful pupils at a dancing class. On Saturday afternoon, William's father gardened and would command a view of the garden wall and scullery roof. On these afternoons also, Cook and Emma both of a suspicious turn of mind, would be at large. On Sunday, Cook and Emma went out. William's mother paid a regular weekly visit to an old friend, and William's father spent the afternoon on the sofa, dead to the world. Moreover, as he pointed out to the outlaws, the members of the Sunday school could be waylaid and indu induced to attend the show, and they would probably be provided with money for collection. Ah, uh, yeah, by their parents to put in the collection plate at Sunday school. Um, the more William thought over it, the more attractive became the idea of a Sunday afternoon in, in spite of superficial difficulties. Therefore, Sunday afternoon was finally chosen. The day was fortunately a fine one and William and the other outlaws were at work early. Mother, William had asked his mother with an expression of meekness and virtue that ought to have warned her of danger if he might have just a few friends in his room for the afternoon. His mother, glad that her husband should be spared his son's restless company, gave willing permission. By half past two, the exhibits were ready. In a cage by the window sat a white rat, painted in faint alternate stripes of blue and pink. This was Douglas's contribution, hand-painted by himself in watercolours. It wore a bewildered expression and occasionally, and occasionally, licked its stripes, and then obviously wished it hadn't. Its cage bore a notice printed on cardboard. Rat from China. Rats are all like this in China. Next came a cat belonging to William's sister, Smuts by name, now imprisoned beneath a basket chair. At the best of times, Smuts was short-tempered, short and all its life had cherished a bitter hatred of William. Now, enclosed by its enemy in a prison two feet square, its fury knew no bounds. It tore at the basket work. It flew wildly round and round, scratching, spitting, swearing. Its chair bore the simple and appropriate notice. Wild cat. William watched it with honest pride and prayed fervently that its indignation would not abate during the afternoon. He wants it to stay rough and wild like it is at the moment when the others come. Next came a giant composed of Douglas upon Ginger's back, draped in two sheets tied tightly round Douglas's neck. This was labelled Gen Win Giant. Ginger was already growing restive. His muffled voice was heard from the folds of the sheets, informing the other outlaws that it was a bit thick and he hadn't known it would be like this or he wouldn't have done it. And anyway, he was going to change with Douglas half-time, or he'd chuck up the whole thing. The next exhibit was a black 
fox fur of William's mother's, to which was fortunately attached a head and several feet. Um, a fox fur was often used as a drape around a woman's neck in the old days when foxes were caught and killed because they would otherwise get into the chickens and things like this. And so rather than wasting them, they used the furs as, as a part of a garment. Um, with a head and several feet, and which he had surreptitiously removed from her wardrobe. This had been tied up and stuffed with waste paper and wired by William till it was, in his eyes, remarkably lifelike. As the legs, even with the assistance of wire, refused to support the body and the head would only droop sadly to the ground, it was perforce exhibited in a recumbent attitude. It bore marks of sticky fingers and of several side slips of the scissors when William was cutting the wire, but on the whole he was justly proud of it. It bore the striking but untruthful legend, Bear Shot by Outlaws in Russia. Russia, spelt not R-U-S-S-I-A, but R-U-S-H-E-R. Next came Blue Dog. This was Henry's fox terrier, generally known as Chips. For Chips, the world was very black. Henry's mastermind had scorned his paint box and his watercolours. Henry had borrowed a blue bag. A blue bag is a, a small, a lump about this big, of bluing, which is in a cloth bag, and you put it in the wash with your whites, and it helps to counteract the yellowing that white um, items such as tablecloths and things like that tend to get in the old days when they didn't have the, the fancy washing powders that we have now. Um, and so that's a blue bag. It was also used as a treatment for things like bee stings. I seem to remember somebody putting a blue bag on my foot once for that purpose. Anyway, we'll carry on. He, Henry had borrowed a blue bag and dabbed it liberally over Chips. Chips had, after the first wild, frenzied struggle, offered no resistance he sat now, a picture of black despair, turning every now and then a melancholy eye upon the still enraged smuts, that's the cat underneath the basket chair. But for him, cats and joy and life and fighting were no more. He was abject, shamed, a blue dog. William himself, as showman, was an imposing figure. He was robed in a red dressing gown of his father's that trailed on the ground behind him and over whose cords in front, uh, trailed on the ground behind him, and over whose cords in front he stumbled ungracefully as he walked. He had cut a few strands from the fringe of a rug and glued them to his lips to represent moustaches. They fell in two straight lines over his mouth. On his head was a tinsel crown once worn by his sister as fairy queen. The show had been widely advertised and all the neighbouring children had been individually canvassed but under strict orders of secrecy. The threats of what the outlaws would do if their secret was disclosed had kept many a child awake at night. Mmm. William surveyed the room proudly. Not a bad show for a penny, I should say. I guess there aren't many like it anyway. Do shut up talking, Ginger. It'll spoil it all but if folks hear the giant talking out of his stomach. It's Douglas that's got to do the giant's talking. Anyone could see that. I say, they're coming, look, they're coming along the wall. There was a thin line of children climbing along the wall in single file on all fours. They ascended the scullery roof and approached the window. These were the first arrivals who had called on their way to Sunday school. Henry took their pennies and William cleared his throat and began. White rat from China, ladies and gentlemen, pink and blue striped. All rats is pink and blue striped in China. This is the only genuine chi China rat in England, brought over from China special last week just for the show. It lives on China bread and butter, brought over special too. Here's a picture of William as an imposing figure with his moustaches and everything. There's the... Um, the ties, the cords from the dressing gown. There's the tail of it hanging out the back because it's too long for him. And he's obviously got some padding in the middle. And he's, he's got the fringe off a rug 
stuck to his top lip with some glue. The rat. Wash it, jeered an unbeliever. Just wash it and let's see it then. Wash it, repeated the showman indignantly. It's got to be washed. It's washed every morning and night, same as you or me. China rats have got to be washed or they'll die right off. Washing them make no difference to their stripes. Anyone knows that. Knows that that no knows that that knows anything about China rats, I guess. He laughed scornfully and turned to Smuts. Smuts had grown used to the basket chair and was settling down for a nap. William crouched down on all fours, ran his fingers along the ba basket work, and putting his face close to it, gave vent to a malicious howl. Smuts sprang at him, scratching and spitting. Wildcat said William triumphantly. Look at it. Kill anyone if it got out. Springing, spring at their throats it would and scratch their eyes out with its paws and bite their necks till its teeth met. If I just moved away that chair it would spring out at you, then moved hastily away from the chair. And I bet some of you would be dead pretty quick. It could have anyone's head right off with biting and scratching, right off, separate from their bodies. There was an awe-stricken silence. Then... Garn, it's smuts, it's your sister's cat. William laughed as though vastly amused by this idea. Smuts, he said, giving a surreptitious kick to the chair that infuriated its occupant still more. I guess there wouldn't be many of us left in this house if smuts was like this. They, good point. They passed on to the giant. A giant, said William, rearranging the tinsel crown, which was slightly too big for him. Real giant, look at it. As big as two of you put together. How do you think he gets in it? Doors and things. Has to have everything made special. Look at him. Walk. Walk, Ginger. Ginger took two steps forward. Douglas clutched his shoulders and murmured anxiously. Why, Jove. Go on, William, urged William scornfully. That's not walking. Goaded Ginger's voice came from the giant's middle regions. If you're go if you're if you go on talking at me, I'll drop him. I'm just about sick of it. All right, said William hastily. Anyway, it's a giant, he went on to his audience. A jolly fine giant. It's got Douglas's face, said one of his audience. William was for a moment at a loss. Well, he said at last, giant's got to have some sort of face, hasn't it? Can't not have a face, can it? The Russian bear, which had often been seen adorning the shoulders of William's mother, and was promptly recognised, was greeted with ribald jeers, but there was no doubt as to the success of the blue dog. Chips advanced deprecatingly, blue head drooping and blue tail between blue legs, making abject apologies for his horrible condition, but Henry had done his work well. They stood round in rapt ad admiration. <laughs> Here's your picture, the genuine giant. There you go. There's Ginger down the bottom and um, Douglas at the top. Blue dogs, said the showman, walking forward proudly and stumbling violently over the cords of the dressing gown. Blue dog, he repeated, recovering his balance and removing the tinsel crown from his nose to his brow. You never saw a blue dog before, did you? No, and you aren't likely to see one again, neither. It was made blue special for this show. It's the only blue dog in the world. Folks will be coming from all over the world to see this blue dog and thrown in in a penny show. If it was in the zoo, you'd have to pay a shilling to see it, I bet. It's, it's just luck for you it's here. I guess the folks at the zoo wish they'd got it. Tain't many shows have blue dogs, brown and black and white, but not blue. Why, folks pay money just to see shows of ornery dogs. So you're just lucky to see a blue dog and a dead bear from Russia and a giant and a wild cat and a china rat for just one penny. After each speech, William had to remove from his mouth the rug fringe, which persisted in obeying the force of gravity rather than William's idea of what a moustache should be. It's just paint. Henry's gates being painted blue, said one critic feebly, but on the whole the outlaws had scored a distinct success with the blue dog. Then, while they stood in silent admiration round the unhappy animal, came a sound from next door, from the next door, a gentle sound like the sighing of the wind through the trees. 
It rose and fell, it rose again and fell again. It increased in volume with each repetition, till at its height it sounded like a wild animal in pain. What's that? said the audience breathlessly. William was slightly uneasy. He was not sure whether this fresh development would add luster or dishonour to his show. Yes, he said darkly to gain time. What is it? I guess you'd, you'd like to know what it is. Gan is just snoring. Snoring, repeated William. It's not ornery snoring, that isn't. Just listen, that's all. You couldn't snore like that, I bet. Huh. They listened spellbound to the gentle sound, growing louder and louder, till at its loudest it brought rapt smiles to their faces. Then ceasing abruptly, then silence. Then again the gentle sound that grew and grew. William gave Henry, uh, asked Henry in a stage whisper if they oughtn't to charge extra for listening to it. The audience hastily explained that they weren't listening, they just couldn't help hearing. A second batch of sightseers had arrived and were paying their entrance pennies, but the first batch refused to move. William, emboldened by success, opened the door and they crept out to the landing and listened with ears pressed to the magic door. Henry now did the honours of showman. William stood, majestic in his glorious apparel, deep in thought. Then to his face came the faint smile that inspiration brings to her votaries. He ordered the audience back into the showroom and shut the door. Then he took off his shoes and softly and with bated breath opened Aunt Emily's door and peeped within. It was rather a close afternoon and she lay on her bed on the top of her eiderdown. She had slipped off her dress skirt so as not to crush it and she lay in her immense stature in a blouse and striped petticoat while from her open mouth issued the fascinating sounds. In sleep, Aunt Emily was not beautiful. William thoughtfully propped up a cushion in the doorway and stood considering the situation. In a few minutes, the showroom was filled with a silent and expectant crowd. In a corner near the door was a new notice, place for taking off shoes and taking oath of silence. William, after administering the oath of silence to a select party in his most impressive manner, led them shoeless and on tiptoe to the next room. From Aunt Emily's bed hung another notice. Fat, wild woman. Talkin native language. Sorry, I had to pause over that because of the way it's spelled. Talkin, not talking. T-O-R-K-I-N. Native language is N-A-T-I-F and L-A-N-G-W-I-D-G-E. Hmm. They stood in a hushed and delighted group around her bed. The sounds never ceased, never abated. William only allowed them two minutes in the room. They came out reluctantly, paid more money, joined the end of the queue and re-entered. More and more children came to see the show, but the show now consisted solely in Aunt Emily. The china rat had licked off all its stripes. Smuts was fast asleep. Ginger was sitting down on the seat of a chair and Douglas on the back of it. And Ginger had insisted at last on air and sight and had put his head out between the two sheet, where the two sheets joined. The Russian bear had fallen onto the floor and no one had picked it up. Chips lay in a disconsolate heap, a victim of acute melancholia, and no one cared for any of these things. Newcomers passed by them hurriedly and stood shoeless in the queue outside Aunt Emily's room, eagerly awaiting their turn. Those who came out simply went to the end again to wait another turn. Many returned home for more money, for Aunt Emily was ten pence extra and each visit after the first half a penny. The Sunday school bell pealed forth its summons, but no one left the show by the sound of it, Sunday school's in the afternoon. No one left the show. The vicar was depressed that evening. The attendance at Sunday school had been the worst on record. And still, Aunt Emily slept and snored with a rapt, silent crowd around her. But William could never rest content. 
He possessed ambition that would have put many of his elders to shame. He cleared the room and reopened it after a few minutes, during which his clients waited in breathless suspense. When they re-entered, there was a fresh exhibit. William's keen eye had been searching out each detail of the room. On the table by her bed now stood a glass containing teeth that William had discovered on the washstand, and a switch of hair and a toothless comb that William had discovered on the dressing table. These all bore notices. Fat, wild woman's teeth. She has false teeth. Fat, wild woman's hair. Um, it wasn't unusual to clip in extra hair, um, especially as women, when they get older, often their hair thins, or used to, I don't know about now. Mine hasn't. Um, and so you'd clip in extra hair because in those days women would have their hair set up and it had to look a certain way. And so if your hair wasn't thick enough for that, then you would actually clip in extra hair for it to look so. Fat Wild Woman's Comb, K-O-M-E. Were it not that the slightest noise meant instant expulsion from the show, some of their number, number had already suffered that bitter fate, there would have been no restraining the audience. As it was, they crept in, silent, expectant, thrilled, to watch and listen for the blissful two minutes, and Aunt Emily never failed them. Still she slept and snored, they borrowed money recklessly from each other, they, the poor sold their dearest treasures to the rich, and still they came again and again, and still... Aunt Emily snored. It would have been it would be interesting to know how long this would have gone on had she not, on the top note of appeal that was pure delight to her audience, awakened with a start and glanced around her. At first she thought that the cluster of small boys around her was a dream, especially as they turned and fled precipitately at once. Then she sat up and her eye fell upon the table by her bed. The notices and finally upon the petrified, horror-stricken showman. She sprang up and, seizing him by the shoulders, shook him till his teeth chattered. The tinsel crown fell down, encircling ears and nose, and one of his moustaches fell limply at his feet. You wicked boy, she said as she shook him. You wicked, wicked, wicked boy! He escaped from her grasp and fled to the showroom, where, in sheer self-defence, he moved a table and three chairs across the door. The room was empty except for Henry, the blue dog, and the still-sleeping smuts. All that was left of the giant was the crumpled sheets. Douglas had, with an awe-stricken, by Jove, snatched up his rat as he fled. The last of their clients was seen scrambling along the top of the garden wall on all fours, with all possible speed. Mechanically, William straightened his crown. She's woke, he said. She's wild mad. He listened apprehensively for angry footsteps descending the stairs and his father's dread summons. But none came. Aunt Emily could be heard moving about in her room, but that was all. A wild hope came to him that, given a little time, she might forget the incident. Let's count the money, said Henry at last. They counted. Four and six, screamed William. Four and six, jolly good, I should say. And it would only have been about two shillings without Aunt Emily. And I thought of her, didn't I? I guess you can all be jolly grateful to me. All right, said Henry unkindly. I'm not envying you, am I? You're welcome to it when she tells your father. And William's proud spirits dropped. Then came the opening of the fateful door and heavy steps descending the stairs. William's mother had returned from her weekly visit to her friend. She was placing her umbrella in the stand as Aunt Emily, hatted and coated and carrying a bag, descended. William's father had just awakened from his peaceful Sunday afternoon slumber and hearing his wife had come into the hall. Aunt Emily fixed her eye upon him Will you be good enough to procure a conveyance, she said. After the indignities to which I have been subjected in this house, I refuse to remain in it a moment longer. Quivering with indignation, she gave details of the indignities to which she had been subjected. 
William's mother pleaded, apologised, coaxed. William's father went quietly out to procure a conveyance. When he returned, she was still talking in the hall. A crowd of vulgar little boys, she was saying, and a horrible inde and horrible indecent placards all over the room. He carried her ba bag down to the cab. And me, in my state of health, she said as she followed him. From the cab, she gave her parting shot. And if this horrible thing hadn't happened, I might have stayed with you all the winter and perhaps part of the spring. William's father wiped his brow with his handkerchief as the cab drove off. How dreadful, said his wife, but she avoided meeting his eye. It's, it's disgraceful of William, she went on with sudden spirit. You must speak with him. I will, said his father determinedly. William, he shouted sternly from the hall. William's heart sank. She's told, he murmured, his last hope gone. You'd better go and get it over. Advi no, you'd better go and get it over, advised Henry. William, repeated the voice still more sternly. Henry moved nearer the window, prepared for instant flight if the voice's owner should follow it up the stairs. Go on, he urged. He'll only come up for you. William slowly removed the barricade and descended the stairs. He had remembered to take off the crown and dressing gown, but his one side of moustache still hung limply over his mouth. His father was standing in the hall. What's that horrible thing on your face? He began. Whiskers, answered William laconically. His father accepted the explanation. Is it true, he went on, that you actually took your friends into your aunt's room without permission and hung vulgar placards round it? William glanced up into his father's face and suddenly took hope. Mr Brown was no actor. Yes, he admitted. It's disgraceful, said Mr Brown. Disgraceful, that's all. But it was not quite all. Something hard and round slipped into William's hand. He ran lightly upstairs. Hello, said Henry, surprised. That's not taken long. What? William opened his hand and showed something that shone upon his extended palm. Look, he said. Crumbs, look. It was a bright half crown. That's a lot of money. I think William's dad was finally pleased that William had done something. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> The boys are having fun and William's dad is rescued. <laughs> That's the end of the chapter, by the way, in case you hadn't figured that one out. <sighs> Welcome to anyone who's just arrived. I'm Jev. I live in New Zealand. Um, the way I write it is NZ because that's why we say our letter Z for Zealand. Um, and I read old-fashioned children's books just because. They're great. Lots of fun. Usually the ones I prefer to read are, are lots of fun. Um, and they're also the stories that I grew up with, my parents grew up with, and my grandparents grew up with. And so I figure, hey, most of the books you can get from the library these days are all n much newer. They're considered old if they're older than five years, like considered very old if they're from the library. A lot of libraries don't stock old books anymore. And there's some wonderful stories that you can enjoy. And so therefore I happily will read them for you. Um, I read them live on Twitch and if you're watching this and you're on YouTube there is a link on my YouTube channel for Twitch so um, if you want to you can go to Twitch and watch me reading live and you can comment in the chat box if you're so inclined. If you're watching this on, you on Twitch and you want to get more of other stories that I've already read I save them over on YouTube because Twitch only keeps the story for two weeks. And I put them into playlists over there so you can have a jolly good listen and a laugh. Some of them are more serious, like drama type stories, and some of them are a little bit more comedic, such as the Bastable series of books, which is um, The Would Be Goods is one of them. The Treasure Seekers um, and New Treasure Seekers, the, the three in that series. Um, and you're welcome to go over there and have a look at them, have a listen to them. They are not like audiobooks because... I chatter in between chapters. I will interrupt myself to explain something because I'm very aware that I understand a lot of things from 
um, the historical context within within these books, having grown up listening to them, reading them, and living a fairly old fashioned lifestyle when I was was a kid. Um, we had lots of old stuff that was in museums, and it was just sort of around the yard. It was normal for us um, to have that sort of thing around. But also, I will sometimes lose my way. I'll be reading a paragraph, I'll get halfway through a sentence, and for some reason, my brain just goes somewhere else. There's something, ooh, shiny, um, that will distract me. Uh, I'm, I have ADHD. And so then I have to try and find it, and we all have a jolly good laugh at me for doing that. Anyway, but it makes for a lot of fun. Um, so I shall have another drink, and this is my formal Friday drink, which is not um, champagne or any other sort of bubbly. It's actually a New Zealand fizzy drink called Allen P, Lemon and Pyro. And I'm having it in a fancy glass. And because it's Friday, and therefore we're doing formal Friday since we're still in lockdown in this part of New Zealand. And it's also time to have your drink of water. And if you didn't have one before, a bottle of water or, or a cup of water or something to drink, go off and get one quickly. And if you need to, have a quick pee. And then we'll carry on reading. Right. Mm. Sorry, I just got a bit, a bit of water splashed up my nose and it tickled. Oh. Yeah, and I get the itchies too. It's part of the ADHD and also probably the autism. My my senses are tuned up louder than most people's. So things get me itchy that most other people wouldn't necessarily notice. It's just the way life is. Makes for it makes for an interesting set of things that happens. Anyway, we are going to carry on reading. Now, I'm reading Just William by Richmond Crompton. And we are reading chapter six, a question of grammar. Okay, a question of grammar. That sounds a bit odd. Right. It was raining. It had been raining all morning. William was intensely bored with his family. What can I do? He demanded of his father for the tenth time. Nothing, said his father fiercely from behind his newspaper. William followed his ma mother into the kitchen. What can I do? He cried plaintively. Couldn't you just sit quietly? Suggested his mother. That's not doing anything, William said. I could sit quietly all day, he went on aggressively, if I wanted. But you never do, said his mother. No, because then the, there wouldn't be any sense in it, would there? Couldn't you read or draw something? No, that's lessons. That's not doing anything. I could teach you to knit if you like. With one crushing glance, William left her. <laughs> that was pretty clever of her, actually, to suggest that if she wanted him to go and do something else. He went into the drawing room where his sister Ethel was knitting a jumper and talking to a friend. And I heard her say to him, she was saying, she broke off with the sigh of a patient martyr. As William came in, he sat down and glared at her. She exchanged a glance of resigned exasperation with her friend. What are you doing, William? said the friend sweetly. Nothing, said William with a scowl. Shut the door after you when you go out, won't you, William? said Ethel equally sweetly. William, at the insult, rose with dignity and went to the door. At the door, he turned. I won't stay here now, he said with slow contempt. Not even if, even if. Even if, he paused to consider the most remote contingency, not even if you wanted me, he said at last, emphatically. He shut the door behind him and his expression relaxed into a sardonic smile. I bet they feel small, he said to the umbrella stand. He went to the library where his 17-year-old brother, Robert, was showing off his new rifle to a friend. You see, he was saying then, catching sight of what saying, then catching sight of William's face round the door, Oh, get out! <laughs> Robert always has the worst of things when William's around, just because William has imagination and Robert doesn't really, and Robert tries to impress, and that doesn't really work very well. William is not impressed. 
Anyway, carrying on. William got out. He returned to his mother in the kitchen with a still more jaundiced view of life. It was still raining. His mother was looking at the tradesman's books. Can I go out? He said gloomily. No, of course not. It's pouring. I don't mind rain. Don't be silly. William considered that few boys in the whole world were handicapped by more unsympathetic parents than he. Why, he said pathetically, have they got friends and me not? Meaning his brother and sister. I suppose you didn't think of asking anyone, she said calmly. Well, can I have someone now? No, it's too late, said Mrs Brown, raising her head from the butcher's book and murmuring ten and eleven pence to herself. So she's doing the housekeeping sums. That's the books. Well, when can I? She raised a harassed face. William, do be quiet. Any time if you ask. Eighteen and tuppence. Can I have lots? Oh, go and ask your father. William went out. He returned to the dining room where his father was still reading a paper. The sigh with which his father greeted his entrance was not one of relief. If you've come to ask questions, he began threateningly. I haven't, said William quickly. Father, when you're all away on Saturday, can I have a party? No, of course not, said his father irritably. Can't you do something? William, goaded to desperation, burst into a flood of eloquence. The sort of things I want to do, they don't want me to do. And the sort of things I don't want to do, they want me to do. Mother said to knit, knit! His scorn and fury were indescribable. His father looked out of the window. Here's your picture. So, there's father with his head turned and looking out the window. And there's William all wound up about it. Thank heavens it stopped raining. Go out. That was father. William went out. There were some quite interesting things to do outside. In the road there were puddles, and the sensation of walking through a puddle, as every boy knows, is a very pleasant one. The hedges, when shaken, sent quite a shower bath upon the shaker, which is also a pleasant sensation. The ditch was full, and there was the thrill of seeing how often one could jump across it without going in. One went in more often than not. It is also fascinating to walk in mud, scraping it along with one's boots. William's spirits rose, but he could not shake off the idea of the party. Quite suddenly, he wanted to have a party, and he wanted to have it on Saturday. His family would be away on Saturday. They were going to spend the day with an aunt. Aunts rarely included William in their invitation. <laughs> Do you remember... Um, playing in the puddles and the ditches, I do. Lots of fun. He went. He came home wet and dirty and cheerful. He approached his father warily. Did you say I could have a party, father? He said casually. No, I did not, said Mr Brown firmly. William let the matter rest for the present. He spent most of the English grammar class in school next morning considering it. There was a great deal to be said for a party in the absence of one's parents and grown-up brother and sister. He'd like to ask George and Ginger and Henry and Douglas and, and, and heaps of them. He'd like to ask them all. They were the whole class, 30 in number. What have I been, what have I just been saying, William? William sighed. That was the foolish sort of question that schoolmistresses were always asking. They ought to know themselves what they'd just been saying better than anyone. He never knew. Why were they always asking him? He looked blank. Then, was it anything about participles? He remembered something vaguely about participles, but it mightn't have been today. Miss Jones groaned. That was ever so long ago, William, she said. You've not been attending. William cleared his throat with a certain dignity and made no answer. Tell him, Henry. Henry ceased his enthralling occupation of trying to push a fly into his inkwell with his nib and answered mechanically, two negatives make an affirmative. Yes, 
Say that, William. William repeated it without betraying any great interest in the fact. Yes. What's a negative, William? William sighed. Something about photographs? He said obligingly. No, snapped Miss Jones. She found William and the heat, William particularly, rather trying. It's no and not, and an affirmative is yes. Oh, said William politely, so two no's and nots mean yes if they're in the same sentence. If you said there is not no money in the box, you mean there is. William considered. He said, oh, again. Then he seemed suddenly to become intelligent. Then he said, if you say no and not in the same sentence, does it mean yes? Certainly. Oh, dear. William smiled. William's smile was a rare thing. Thank you, he said. Miss Jones was quite touched. It's all right, William, she said. I'm glad you're beginning to take an interest in your work. William was murmuring to himself, No, of course not, and no, I did not, and a no and a not mean yes, so he meant yes, of course, and yes, I did. He waited till the Friday before he gave his invitations, with a casual air. My folks is going away tomorrow, and they said I could have a few friends in to tea. Can you come? Tell your mother they just said, they said just to come and not bother to write. He was a born strategist. Not one of his friend's parents guessed the true state of affairs. Sorry, itchy. And carrying on. Not one of his friend's parents guessed the true state of affairs. When William's conscience, that curious organ, rose to reproach him, he said to it firmly, he said I could. He said, yes, of course. He said, yes, I did. He asked them all. He thought that while you were having a party, you might as well have a big one. He hinted darkly at unrestrained joy and mirth. They all accepted the invitation. William's mother took an anxious farewell of him on Saturday morning. You don't mind being left, darling, do you? No, mother, said William with perfect truth. You wouldn't do anything we've told you not to, will you? No, mother. Only things you've said yes to. Cook and Jane had long looked forward to this day. There would be very little to do in the house, and as far as William was concerned, they hoped for the best. William was out all the morning. At lunch he was ominously quiet and polite. Jane decided to go with her young man to the pictures. Cook said she didn't mind being left as that Master William had gone out and there seemed to be no prospect of his return before tea time. So Jane went to the pictures. At three o'clock the postman came and Cook went to the door for the letters. Then she stood gazing down the road as though transfixed. William had collected his guests en route. He was bringing them joyfully home with him. Clean and starched and prim, they had issued from their homes, but they had grown hilarious under William's benign influence. They had acquired sticks and stones and old tins from the ditches as they came along. They perceived from William's general attitude towards it that it was no ordinary party. They were a happy crowd. William headed them with a trumpet. They trooped in at the garden gate, cook, pale and speechless, watched them. Then her speechlessness departed. You're not coming in here, she said fiercely. What have you brought all those boys cluttering up the garden? They've come to tea, said William calmly. She grew paler still. That they've not, she said fiercely. What would your father say? He said they could come, said William. I asked him and he said yes, of course. And I asked if he'd said so and he said yes, I did. That's what he said, because of English grammar and what Mrs. Miss Jones said. Cook's answer was to slam the door in his face and lock it. The 30 guests were slightly disconcerted, but not for long. Come on, shouted William excitedly. She's the enemy. Let's storm her old castle. The guests' spirits rose. They, this promised to be an infinitely... This promised to be 
infinitely superior to the usual party. They swarmed round to the back of the house. The enemy had bolted the back door and was fastening all of the windows. Purple with fury, she shook her fist at William through the drawing room window. William brandished his piece of stick and blew his trumpet in defiant reply. The army had armed itself with every kind of weapon, including the raspberry canes, whose careful placing was the result of a whole day's work of William's father. William decided to climb up to the balcony outside Ethel's open bedroom window with the help of his noble band. The air was full of their defiant war whoops. They filled the front garden, trampling on all the rose beds, cheering William as he swarmed up to the balcony, his trumpet between his lips. The enemy appeared at the window and shut it with a bang, and William, startled, dropped down amongst his followers. They raised a hoarse roar of anger. Mean old cat, shouted the enraged general. Here's the picture. There's the cook. There's the kids coming in. They trooped in at the garden gate. Cook, pale and speechless, watched them. Mean old cat, shouted the enraged general. The blood of the army was up. No army of 30 strong, worthy of its name, could ever consent to be worsted by an enemy of one. All the doors and windows were bolted. There was only one thing to be done, and this the general did, encouraged by loyal cheers from his army. Go it, old William! Yeah! He oo! The stone with which William broke the drawing room window fell upon a small occasional table, ch scattering Mrs. Brown's cherished silver far and wide. William, with the born general's contempt for the minor devastations of war, enlarged the hole and helped his gallant band through with only a limited number of cuts and scratches. They were drunk with the thrill of battle. Sorry. They left the garden with its wreck of rose trees and its trampled lawn and crowded through the broken window with, its, with imminent danger to life and limb. The enemy was shutting the small window of the coal cellar and there William imprisoned her, turning the key with a loud yell of triumph. So Cook has been shut in the coal cellar. The party then proceeded. It fulfilled the expectations of the guests that it was to be a party unlike any other party. At other parties they played, a hide, played hide and seek, with smiling but firm mothers and aunts and sisters, stationed at intervals with dampening effects upon one's spirits, with not in the bedrooms, dear, and mind the umbrella stand, and certainly not in the drawing room, and don't shout so loud, darling, but this was hide and seek from the realms of perfection. Up the stairs and down the stairs, in all the bedrooms, sliding down the balusters, in and out of the drawing room, leaving trails of muddy boots and shattered ornaments as they went. Ginger found a splendid hiding place in Robert's bed, where his boots left a perfect impression of their muddy soles in several places. Henry found another in Ethel's wardrobe, crouching upon her satin evening shoes among her evening dresses. George banged the drawing room door with such violence that the handle came off in his hand. Douglas became entangled in the dining room curtain, which yielded to his struggles and descended upon him and an old china bowl upon the sideboard. It was such a party as none of them had dreamed of. It was bliss undiluted. The house was full of shouting and yelling, of running to and fro, of small boys mingled with subterranean murmurs, of Cook's rage. Cook was uttering horrible imprecations and hurling lumps of coal at the door. She was Irish and longed to return to the fray. It was William who discovered first that it was tea time and there was no tea. At first he felt slightly aggrieved, then he thought of the larder and his spirits rose. Come on, he said, all just get what you want, what you can. They trooped in, panting, shouting, laughing, and they all just got what they could. Ginger seized the remnants of a cold ham and picked the bone. George, with great gusto, drank a whole jar of cream. William and Douglas, between them, ate a gooseberry pie. Henry ate a whole currant cake. Each foraged for himself. 
They ate two bowls of cold vegetables, a joint of cold beef, two pots of honey, three dozen oranges, three loaves and two pots of dripping. They experimented upon lard, onions and raw sausages. They left the larder a place of gaping emptiness. Meanwhile, Cook's voice, growing hoarser and hoarser as the result of the inhalation of coal dust, coal dust and exhalation of imprecations, still arose from the depths and still the door of the coal cellar shook and rattled. Then one of the guests who had been in the drawing room window came back. She's coming home, he shouted excitedly. They flocked to the window. Jane was bidding a fond farewell to her young man at the side gate. Don't let her come in, yelled William. Come on, with a smile of blissful reminiscence upon her face. Jane turned in at the gate. She was totally unprepared for being met by a shower of missiles from upper windows. A lump of lard hit her on the ear and knocked her hat on one side. She retreated hastily to the side gate. Go on, send her into the road. A shower of onions, the ham bone and a few potatoes pursued her into the road. Shouts of triumph rent the air. Then the shouts of triumph died away abruptly. I'm just going to show you. Here she is being pelted with various things from the upper windows. Then the shouts of triumph died away abruptly. William's smile also faded away. And his hand, in the act of flinging an onion, dropped. A cab was turning in at the front gate. In the sudden silence that fell upon the party, Cook's hoarse cries for vengeance rose with redoubled force from the coal cellar. William grew pale. The cab contained his family. Two hours later, a small feminine friend of William's who had called with a note for his mother looked up to William's window and caught sight of William's untidy head. Come and play with me, William, she called eagerly. I can't. I'm going to bed, said William sternly. Why? Are you ill, William? No. Well, why are you going to bed, William? William leaned out of the window. I'm going to bed, he said, because my father don't understand about English grammar. That's why. And that is the last page in that chapter. Oh, my goodness. Such mischief. So because the grammar made sense to him, he just assumed that that was okay until the family came home and the, his brain said, mm, probably not. That's why he went silent. Oh, dear. Oh, my goodness. What a mess. What a terrible mess that would have been. Me as an adult thinking. Oh, my goodness. Oh, not good. So, I'm going to read one more chapter. But I'm going to have another drink of water. Just William by Richmond Crompton. Chapter 7. William Joins the Band of Hope. William, you've been playing that dreadful game again, said Mrs Brown despairingly. William, his suit covered with dust, his tie under one ear, his face begrimed and his knees cut, looked at her in righteous indignation. I haven't. I haven't done anything what you said I'd not to. It was lions and tamers what you said I'd not to play. Well, I've not played lions and tamers, not since you said I'd not to. I wouldn't do it, not for, if thousands of people asked me not Ask me to, not when you'd said I'd not to, I... Mrs Brown interrupted him. Well, what have you been playing at? She said wearily. It was tigers and tamers, said William. It's a different game altogether. In lions and tamers, half of you is lions and the other half tamers. And the tamers try to tame the lions and the lions try not to be tamed. That's lions and tamers. It's all there is to it. It's quite a little game. What do you do in tigers and tamers? 
said Mrs. Brown suspiciously. Well, William considered deeply. Well, he repeated lamely, in tigers and tamers, half of you is tigers, you see, and the other half... It's exactly the same thing, William, said Mrs. Brown, with sudden spirit. I don't see how you can call it the same thing, said William doggedly. You can't call a lion a tiger, can you? It just isn't one. They're in quite different cages in the zoo. Tigers and tamers can't be exactly the same as lions and tamers. Well then, said Mrs. Brown firmly, you're never to play tigers and tamers either. And now go and wash your face. William's righteous indignation increased. My face, he repeated as if he could hardly believe his ears. My face? I've washed it twice today. I washed it when I got up and I washed it for dinner. You told me to. Well, just go and look at it, said his mother. William walked over to the looking glass and surveyed his reflection with interest. Then he passed his hands lightly over the discoloured surface of his face, stroking his hair back and straightening his tie. This done, he turned hopefully to his mother. It's no good, she said. You must wash your face and brush your hair, and you'd better change your suit and stockings. They're simply covered with dust. William turned slowly to go from the room. I shouldn't think, he said bitterly as he went, You, I shouldn't think there's many houses where so much washing and brushing goes on as in this, and I'm glad for their sakes. She heard him coming downstairs ten minutes later. William, she called. He entered. He was transformed. His face and hair shone. He had changed his suit. His air of righteous indignation had not diminished. That's better, said his mother approvingly. Now, William, do just sit down here till tea time. There's only about ten minutes, and it's no good you going out. You'll only get yourself into a mess again if you don't sit still. William glanced round the drawing room with the air of one goaded beyond bearing. Here? Well, dear, just till tea time. What can I do in here? There's nothing to do, is there? I can't sit still and not do anything, can I? Oh, read a book. There are ever so many books over there you haven't read, and I'm sure you'd like some of them. Try one of Scott's, she ended rather doubtfully. William walked across the room with an expression of intense suffering, took out a book at random and sat down in an attitude of aloof dignity, holding the book upside down. It was thus that Mrs. De Vere Carter found him when she was announced a moment later. Mrs. De Vere Carter was a recent addition to the neighbourhood. Before her marriage, she had been one of the Randalls of Hertfordshire, of Hertfordshire. Everyone on whom Mrs. De Vere Carter smiled felt intensely flattered. And it, she was tall and handsome and gushing and exquisitely dressed. Her arrival had caused quite a sensation. Everyone agreed that she was charming. On entering Mrs. Brown's drawing room, she saw a little boy dressed very neatly with a clean face and well-brushed hair, sitting quietly on a low chair in a corner reading a book. The little dear, she murmured, as she shook hands with Mrs. Brown, William's face darkened. Mrs. De Vere Carter floated over to him. Well, my little man, and how are you? Her little man did not answer, partly because Mrs. De Vere Carter had put a hand on his head and pressed his face against her perfumed, befrilled bosom. His nose narrowly escaped being impaled on the thorn of a huge rose that nestled there. I adore children, she cooed to his mother over his head. And I shall show you. There's Mrs. De Vere Carter giving William a little bit of a hug. I don't know if she has much experience of real children. We're about to find out. And what was the chapter called, by the way? Do you remember? William joins the band of hope. Oh dear. I adore children, she cooed to his mother over his head. William freed his head with a somewhat brisk movement, and she took up his book. Scott, she murmured, dear little laddie. Seeing the expression on William's face, his mother hastily drew her guest aside. 
Do come and sit over here, she said nervously. What perfect weather we're having. William walked out of the room. You know, I'm frightfully interested in social work, went on her charming guest, especially among children. I adore children, sweet little dear of yours, and I always get on with them. Of course, I get on with most people. My personality, you know. You've heard, perhaps, that I've taken over the Band of Hope here, and I'm turning it into such a success. The pets. Yes, three lumps, please. Well, now, it's here I want you to help me. You will, dear, won't you? You and your little mannequin, I want to get a different class of children to join the Band of Hope. Such a sweet name, isn't it? It would do the village children such a lot of good to meet with children of our class. Mrs. Brown was flattered. After all, Mrs. De Vere Carter was one of the Randalls. For instance, went on the flute-like tones, when I came in and saw your little treasure sitting there so sweetly, she pointed dramatically to the chair that had lately been graced by William's presence. I thought to myself, oh, I must get him to come. It's the refining influence of children in our class that the village children need. What delicious cakes. You will lend him to me, won't you? We meet once a week on Wednesday afternoons. May he come? I'll take great care of him. Mrs. Brown hesitated. Uh, yes, she said doubtfully, but I don't know that William is really suited to that sort of thing. However, oh, you can't put me off, said Mrs. De Vere Carter, shaking a playful, bejeweled finger. Don't I know him already? I count him one of my dearest little friends. It never takes me long to know children. I'm a born child lover. Oh, dear. I'm really hoping that William teaches her a lesson, just like the aunt. Yeah, what do you think, hey? Wouldn't it be good <laughs> for her to learn the hard way? Yeah. Anyway, we'll carry on. William happened to be passing through the hall as Mrs. De Vere Carter came out of the drawing room, followed by Mrs. Brown. There you are, she said. I thought you'd be waiting to say goodbye to me. She stretched out her arm with an encircling movement, but William stepped back and stood looking her at her with a sinister frown. I have so enjoyed seeing you. I hope you'll come again, untruthfully stammered Mrs. Brown, moving so as to block out the sight of William's face. But Mrs. De Vere Carter was not to be checked. There are people to whom the expression on a child's face conveys absolutely nothing. Once more she floated towards William. Goodbye, Willie dear. You're not too old to kiss me, are you? Mrs. Brown gasped. At the look of concentrated fury on William's face, older and stronger people than Mrs. De Vere Carter would have quailed, but she only smiled as, with another virulent glare at her, he turned on his heel and walked away. The sweet, shy thing, she cooed. I love them shy. Mr. Brown was told of the proposal. Well, he said slowly, I can't quite visualise William at a Band of Hope meeting, but of course if you want him to go, he must go. You see, said Mrs Brown with a worried frown, she made such a point of it, and she really is very charming, and after all she's rather influential. She was one of the Randalls, you know, it seems silly to offend her. Did William like her? She was sweet to him, at least she meant to be sweet. She corrected herself hastily. But you know how touchy William is, and you know the name he always hates so. I can never understand why. After all, lots of people are called Willie. The morning of the day of the Band of Hope meeting arrived. William came down to breakfast with an agonised expression on his healthy countenance. He sat down on his seat and raised his hand to his brow with a hollow groan. Mrs Brown stared up in dismay. Oh, William, what's the matter? Got a sick headache, said William in a faint voice. Oh, dear, I am sorry. You'd better go and lie down. I'm so sorry, dear. I think I will go and lie down, said William's plaintive, suffering voice. I'll just have breakfast first. Oh, I wouldn't. Not with a sick headache, said his mother. William gazed hungrily at the eggs and bacon. I think I could eat some, Mother, just a bit. 
No, I wouldn't, dear. It will only make it worse. <laughs> I think she knows him quite well. Very reluctantly, William returned to his room. Mrs Brown visited him after breakfast. No, he was not better, but he thought he'd go for a little walk. Yes, he still felt very sick. She suggested a strong dose of salt and water. He might feel better if he'd actually been sick. Yes, that's an old-fashioned remedy, which, in the right situation, is very good. If you're feeling sick in your stomach, like you kind of want to throw up and it's not happening, you make a warm drink of salt and water, strong with salt, and you drink it, and your stomach says, ooh, yuck, no, and it throws up, along with everything else, which is probably what's bothering your stomach. Anyway, it does work. It can work. He might have felt better if he'd actually been sick, which is why she was suggesting a strong dose of salt and water. No, he'd hate to give her the trouble. Besides, it wasn't that kind of sickness. He was most emphatic on that point. It wasn't that kind of sickness. He thought a walk would do him good. He felt he'd like a walk. Well wrapped up and walking with little unsteady steps, he set off. Sorry. He set off down the drive, followed by his mother's anxious eyes. Then he crept back behind the rhododendron bushes next to the wall and climbed in at the larder window. The cook came agitatedly to Mrs Brown half an hour later, followed by William, pale and outraged. He's eat nearly everything, ma'am. You never saw he's such a thing. He's eat the cold ham and kidney pie and he's eat them three cold sausages and he's eat all that, that new jar of lemon cheese. William, gasped Mrs Brown, you can't have a sick headache if you've eaten all that. That was the end of the sick headache. He spent the rest of the morning with Henry and Douglas and Ginger. William and Henry and Douglas and Ginger constituted a secret society called the Outlaws. It had few aims beyond that of secrecy. William was its acknowledged leader and he was proud of the honour. If they knew, if they guessed, he grew hot and cold at the thought. Suppose they saw him going or someone told them he would never hold up his head again. He made tentative efforts to find out their plans for the afternoon. If only he knew where they'd be, he might avoid them somehow. But he got no satisfaction. And here you go, here's the picture of Cook telling the mistress of the house, William's mother, about all the things he's eaten in the larder. But he got no satisfaction with trying to find out what the others were going to do. They spent the morning rabbiting in a wood with Henry's fox terrier Chip, Chips and William's mongrel Jumble. None of them saw or heard a rabbit. But Jumble chased a butterfly and a bee and scratched up a molehill and was stung by a wasp and Chips caught a field mouse, so the time was not wasted. William's interest, however, was half-hearted. He was turning over plan after plan in his mind, all of which he finally rejected as impracticable. He entered the dining room for lunch rather earlier than usual. Only Robert and Ethel, his elder brother and sister, were there. He came in limping, his mouth set into a straight line of agony, his brows frowning. Hello, what's up? said Robert, who had not been in at breakfast and had forgotten about the band of hope. I've sprained my ankle, said William weakly. Here, sit down, old chap, and let me feel it, said Robert sympathetically. William sat down meekly upon a chair. Which is it? Uh, this. It's a pity you limped with the other, said Ethel dryly. That was the end of the sprained ankle. The Band of Hope meeting was to begin at three. His family received with complete indifference his complaint of sudden agonising toothache at half past two, of acute rheumatism at 25 to 3, and of a touch of liver. William considered this a heaven-sent inspiration. It was responsible for many of his father's absences from work. At 20, at 20 to 3, at a quarter to 3, he was ready in the hall. I'm sure you'll enjoy it, William, said Mrs Brown soothingly. I expect you'll all play games and have quite a good time. William treated her with silent contempt. 
Hey, Jumbo, he called. After all, life could never be absolutely black, as long as it held Jumbo. Jumbo darted ecstatically from the kitchen regions, his mouth covered with dra- gravy, dropping a half-picked bone on the hall carpet as he came. William, you can't take a dog to a band of hope meeting. Why not? said William indignantly. I don't see why not. Dogs don't drink beer, do they? They have as much right at a band of hope meeting as I have, don't, haven't they? There seems just nothing anyone can do. Well, I'm sure it wouldn't be allowed. No one takes dogs to meetings. She held Jumble firmly by the collar and William set off reluctantly down the drive. I hope you'll enjoy it, she called cheerfully. He turned back and looked at her. It's a wonder I'm not dead, he said bitterly. The things I have to do. He walked slowly, a dejected, dismal figure. At the gate he stopped and glanced cautiously up and down the road. There were three more figures coming down the road with short intervals between them. They were Henry, Douglas and Ginger. William's first instinct was to dart back and wait till they had passed. Then something about their figures struck him. They also had a dejected, dismal, hangdog look. He waited for the first one, Henry. Henry gave him a shame-faced glance and was going to pass him by. You going too, said William. Henry gasped in su- surprise. Did she come to your mother, was his reply. He was surprised to see Ginger and Douglas behind him, and Ginger was surprised to see Douglas behind him. They walked together sheepishly in a depressed silence to the village hall. Once Ginger raised a hand to his throat. Got a beastly throat, he complained. I didn't ought to be out. I'm ill too, said Henry. I told him so. And me, said Douglas. And me, said William in a hoarse, mirthless laugh. Cruel sort of thing, sending us all out ill like this. At the door of the village hall, they halted. And William looked longingly toward the field. It's no good, said Ginger sadly. They'll find out. Bitter and despondent, they entered. Within sat a handful of gloomy children who, inspired solely by hopes of the annual treat, were regular attendants at the meeting. Mrs. Devere Carter came sailing down to them, her frills and scarves floating round her, bringing with her a strong smell of perfume. Dear children, she said, welcome welcome to our little gathering. These, she addressed the regular members, who turned gloomy eyes upon the outlaws, these are our dear new friends. We must make them so happy, dear children. She led them to seats in the front row and, taking her stand in front of them, addressed the meeting. Now, girlies dear and laddies dear, what do I expect you to be at these meetings? And in answer came a bored, monotonous chant. Respectful and reposeful. I have a name, children dear. Respectful and reposeful Mrs. Devere Carter. That's it, children dear. Respectful and reposeful. Now our new little our little new friends, what do I expect you to be? No answer. The outlaws sat, horrified. Outraged, shamed. You're such shy darlings, aren't you? She said, stretching out an arm. William retreated hastily, and Ginger's face was pressed hard against a diamond brooch. You won't be shy with us long, I'm sure. We're so happy here, happy and good. Now, children dear, what is it we must be? Again, the bored, monotonous chant. Happy and good, Mrs. Devere Carter. That's it now, darlings, in the front row you tell me. Willie, pet, you begin. What is it we must be? At that moment, William was nearer committing murder than at any other time in his life. He caught a gleam in Henry's eye. Henry would remember. William choked but made no answer. You tell me then, Harry boy. Henry went purple. William's spirits rose. Ah, you won't be so shy next week, will they, children, dear? No, Mrs. Devere Carter, came the prompt, listless response. 
Now we'll begin with one of our dear little songs. Give out the books. She seated herself at the piano. Number five, Sparkling Water. Collect your thoughts, children dear. Are you ready? She struck the opening chords. The outlaws, though provided with books, did not join in. They had no objection to water as a beverage. They merely objected to singing about it. Mrs. De Vere Carter rose from the piano. Now we'll play one of our games, children dear. You can begin by yourselves, can't you, darlings? I'll just go across the field and see why little Teddy Wheeler hasn't come. He must be regular, mustn't he, laddies, dear? Now what game shall we play? We had puss in the corner last week, hadn't we? We'll have... Here we go round the mulberry bush this week, shall we? No, not blind man's buff, darling. It's a horrid rough game. Now, while I'm gone, see if you can make these four shy darlings more at home, will you? And play quietly. Now, before I go, tell me four things that you must do, you must be. Respectful and reposeful and happy and good, Mrs. De Vere Carter came the chant. She was away about a quarter of an hour. When she returned, the game was in full swing, but it was not. Here we go round the mulberry bush. There was a screaming, struggling crowd of children in the village hall. Benches were overturned and several chairs broken. With yells and whoops and blows and struggles, the tamers tried to tame. With growls and snarls and bites and struggles, the animals tried not to be tamed. Gone were all, was all listlessness and all boredom. And William, his tie hanging in shreds, his coat torn, his head cut, and his voice hoarse led the fray as a tamer. Come on, you! I'll get you! Grrr. Go it, men! Catch him! Beat him! Knife him! Kill him! The spirited roarings and bellowing of the animals was almost blood-curdling. Above it all, Mrs. De Vere Carter coaxed and expo expostulated and wrung her hands. I'm just going to see. Oh, here you go. Here's the picture. It's all in... And there she is, just coming into the hall. What a shock for her. <laughs> her dears behaving like that. Above it all, Mrs. De Vere Carter coaxed and expostulated and wrung her hands. Respectful and resp reposeful. Happy and good. Laddies, dear. And Willie floated unheeded over the tide of battle. Then somebody, reports afterwards differed as to who it was, rushed out of the door into the field, and there the battle was fought to a finish. From there the band of hope, undismissed, reluctantly separated to its various homes, battered and bruised, but blissfully happy. Mrs Brown was anxiously awaiting William's return. When she saw him, she gasped and sat down weakly on a hall chair. William! I've not, said William quickly, looking at her out of a fast closing eye. So he's had a thump to the eye, which is going black and swelling up shut now. I've not been playing at either of them, not those what you said I'd not to. Then what? It was, it was tamers and crocodiles, and we played it at the Band of Hope. And that's the end of the chapter and today's reading. Oh, <laughs> not quite what Mrs. De Vere Carter was expecting to have happen, was it? Hmm. Anyway, I'm going to give you a couple of links. I'm going to give you the link for my Discord server, which you are most welcome to, to join. And you can discuss stories that we've read and stories that you might think would be worth reading in the future. And also, oh, and share pictures of things relevant to the stories that we've been having. Um, I'm trying to get it set up so we have different channels for each of the books. And also, I'm going to give you the YouTube um, link. There it is. For those of you who are watching on Twitch, um, 
you can go over to YouTube and to my channel and you'll find playlists of all the different books I've read so far. Uh, the stories that I read here stay here for two weeks on Twitch and then they get transferred across to YouTube without all the extra surroundings, without the actual chat box or anything like that. Although you can leave comments underneath and that would be lovely. I've had some lovely comments recently on different stories that I've been reading. Just how people were encouraged by them. Also, there was somebody who, it was a favourite story of theirs and they have now actually shared that story with one of their children and it's now their child's favourite story, one of their favourite stories too. So that was really lovely to hear that. So feel free to, here on Twitch, follow me and Twitch will notify you when I go live or at on YouTube you can subscribe and also if you click the bell icon YouTube will notify you when I have a new video up there so there you go off you go go and do it and I'll see you around next time bye